Hey, I'm Jake from CVP, and today we're taking a look at a new camera from Sony that I really didn't expect. This is the ZV-E1, Sony's latest addition to its more content creator focused line of cameras. But this little camera has some familiar specs, big features, and a few interesting AI related tricks up its sleeve. The ZV-E1 is priced at roughly £2,350 body only, or £2,600 with the Sony 28-60mm kit lens. This may seem expensive for a ZV series camera, but this camera actually features the same sensor that Sony have used in the A7S III, FX3, FX6 and FR7. The fact that you can now get a camera with this sensor in it for this price is awesome, as it really can produce some great imagery and it's incredibly versatile for content creators and filmmakers. There is a reason that the A7S III and FX3 have been so popular in this market. We unfortunately didn't have very long with the ZV-E1 or much time to prepare anything to shoot with it, but we did manage to scramble together some test footage and unsurprisingly, it looks very close to the A7S III and FX3. As I said before, the ZV-E1 features the same full frame 12 megapixel back illuminated CMOS sensor as the A7S III. This means it features the same excellent fast readout speed, which means good rolling shutter performance, standard dynamic range and improved color science. When shooting in the full frame 4K mode, the camera is actually downsampling a larger than 4K portion of the sensor with no pixel binning, which helps deliver the excellent image quality that we know this sensor can deliver. This sensor also has a dual native ISO, which is the same as the A7S III. So in S-Log3, the low base is 640 and the high base is 12,800. Unlike the ZV-E1's bigger brothers, which I formerly mentioned, when you go into log shooting mode, you are limited to just the flexible ISO mode. No Cine EI at all here. In this mode, the native ISO switches when you hit 12,800. So really, you want to switch up to the high base when hitting the higher ISOs just before 12,800 to get the best noise performance. This sensor can really be pushed into some seriously high ISOs and you can still get very usable results, which for a content creation camera where you need versatility and flexibility, it's fantastic. When in this flexible ISO mode, you cannot output UHD while also recording internally, which is a bit weird, just HD. However, if you do want to shoot S-Log3 while still outputting 4K and recording 4K internally, you can tweak a picture profile to use S-Log3 as Gamma3.Cine, which is really easy to do. When it comes to latitude, we compared the ZV-E1 to the Panasonic S5 II. Both cameras were rated at their lowest base ISO. We used an Otis 55mm f1.4 and dealt with the very slight difference in exposure between the cameras using shutter speed. And all shots were normalized in Resolve. Overexposure performance is quite similar between the two cameras. However, there is quite a big difference between the under exposure tests. They both have pretty significantly different noise patterns. I think the ZV-E1 looks a bit washed out, but the S5 II is so much greener, though I do think it holds onto detail a little bit better. Incredibly, this camera features the same recording options as the A7S III. This means you have the ability to record in XAVC HS 4K, XAVC S 4K, XAVC HD, XAVC S I 4K, and XAVC S I HD. This is a great range of options to include. The fact you've got three flavors of XAVC 4K so you can easily choose exactly what you need depending on what you want to shoot is great. I personally like to keep the camera mainly in XAVC S I 4K when I know I have enough media to deal with the increased data rates. All of this is available in a mix of 42 10 bit or 408 bit, depending on what you choose. I would suggest shooting in 42 10 bit when possible, as the improved chroma subsampling and bit depth available will make grading S-Log3 footage so much better and you will not experience the negative effects such as banding when grading 8-bit 420 footage. You can swap between PAL and NTSC and this will change the base frame rates available. In NTSC you have 24, 30 and 60 and in PAL you have 25 and 50. This will also change the available output resolutions via the USB-C outputs which we'll get into in a bit. The ZV-1 at release will be able to record 4K up to 60 frames per second and 1080p up to 120 frames per second. However, towards June, Sony will be releasing a new firmware for it, which will allow for the same frame rates that the A7S III and FX3 can capture, which means 4K up to 120 frames per second and Full HD up to 240 frames per second, using the camera's full sensor. This is incredibly impressive given the price difference between the ZV-E1 and the A7S III, and at its price, it's quite a unique feature for a camera to offer. As it is using the full sensor, the image quality is really great. And it's another massive reason why this sensor is so versatile. As I mentioned earlier, the ZV-E1 features a range of updated tools that harness the power of AI. 
So let's take a look at what that actually means. First off, the ZV-E1 features the latest version of Sony's autofocus system. And this means that it features the same updated AI processing unit as the A7R5 did, which not only improves the speed and reliability, but also adds better subject detection for not only humans, but also airplanes, cars, animals, birds, and insects. These are all available in both stills and video mode. This new AI processing unit works in the background and allows the camera to recognize humans when they are smaller in the frame by recognizing what limbs are what. This means that autofocus starts tracking faster than the previous generation systems from our testing. It really does perform very well here. However, the ZV-E1 does feature good manual focus tools as well, like a punch in and peek in, and even the newer focus map tool added a few cameras back now by Sony and their lens breathing conversation mode as well. This mode will also be coming to post-production tools in an upcoming update. This will allow you to record with it turned off in the camera while still recording your lens's metadata if it is a compatible native Sony lens and then dial in the exact amount of breathing compensation you want to use in post. This is a really good feature to have as some of the Sony E-mount lenses do have a fair bit of focused breathing. In camera, you can toggle this on when using a compatible lens. Just bear in mind this does apply a little crop to your image. Sony has also added a new product showcase mode. This adds a red box in the frame and when you bring up a product into frame, it will focus on that and then when you remove it, it will focus back to you. This is essentially a built-in preset for the focus for people who are wanting a setup like this and it works, but I'm sure this would be possible with the correct autofocus settings dialed in. It might just be a bit smarter thanks to the improved subject detection. Another one of the new AI-based modes is an auto framing tool. This uses the camera's subject detection to reframe it in camera. You can go into the menu and control a range of things related to this. You can change between the different framing operation modes, level of the crop in on your subject and how fast it tracks your subject. You can then decide whether or not you want this crop applied to the internally recorded image or to the HDMI feed out of the camera. This will be good so you can record a clean feed of your entire frame while also recording the auto framing version with the crops as well. And I think recording the clean frame is crucial as it can do some funky movements and get confused at times. So you will want your clean take to cover those up if you need to in post. The different framing modes are where you can choose between whether it tracks a single person or moves between two on a timer. This could be handy if you're doing an interview with someone and don't want to crop in in the edit, or if you're outputting it to like a live stream or something. However, the frame moves, it doesn't cut. So while it's a nice idea, I do think it looks a bit weird. A cut between your subjects would have been much better here. I think the solo mode makes more sense and for people filming themselves, it could be good and save you some time in post. In the start when tracking mode, the camera can recognize that there are multiple subjects in the frame and you can then tap on the rear of the LCD to switch the subjects. The camera can still record a 4K image in this mode, which is probably achievable thanks to Sony's clear image zoom trickery that they do. However, from our limited testing, you can definitely see a drop in image quality when using the heavier crop modes. It's an interesting tool for content creators and could be worth experimenting with. And fingers crossed Sony just continue to improve it as I think it could be a really awesome tool once it's refined a bit more. The ZV-E1 features a few different stabilization modes. You have standard, which is what I would suggest running whenever you're shooting handheld, active, dynamic active and a new framing stabilizer. Active crops in a little bit, whereas dynamic active is a new stabilization mode which crops in even more into the image to give you a more stabilization power and it can produce some excellent results. It seems to have been designed for video, especially when you're walking, but you can notice a drop in image quality and you are reducing your field of view. So you may want to compensate by shooting with a wider focal length. This new framing stabilizer analyzes the frame to recognize your subjects in frame and then in camera, crops around the body of your subject. This can produce some pretty good footage, but can also result in some weird tracking. This is possible to do in post, but would require much more time to process the tracking and the stabilizing. Doing this in camera can result in some pretty heavy cropping, but this could be a helpful feature for some people, and it's great to see Sony trying to do something a bit different. Next, you have a defocus button, and this will work best when in the auto mode of the camera for people who are new to using a camera system like this, for them to quickly change the look of the image between a shadow depth of field and a deep depth of field. This mode essentially adjusts your aperture by using a combination of ISO and shutter speed. And I did notice a weird little quirk with it. It drops down your shutter speed down to 1 30th of a second when not moving the camera, which will result in some awful looking motion blur. But then when you move the camera, it picks up to 1 100th of a second. It's a shame that this is handled this way as there is no way to change it. It dropping down to 1 30th of a second could be okay for talking headpieces, 
but it would have been better if Sony could have just used ISO instead of shutter, or at least not allowed the system to go below double your frame rate to maintain natural motion blur. When it comes to color, there are several ways to tailor your image. As we've mentioned, it has the ability to shoot in S-Log3, S-Gamma3 Cine, which has become Sony's standard log profile now. And it will be what you want to shoot if you want to take your footage into post and get the exact look you want. It also means that you can get used to shooting and processing in this gamma and gamma with this camera, which is great as the entire Sony Cinema line can use this. So you can easily progress onto another camera in the line and apply the same knowledge into shooting with that system as this system. It also has a Cinetone built in, which can result in some nice imagery straight out of camera. You can also load in LUTs, which you can bake into your recorded image or just use as a monitoring LUT. In the more auto modes, you can use a quick access My Image Style menu, which gives you a really stripped back, easy to use set of parameters to control the look of your image. This is definitely more tailored towards beginners, but could be a good thing for people wanting to record a good looking image very quickly without understanding all the technical stuff. One feature that I didn't expect to see is this new cinematic vlog mode. This is essentially designed to give content creators and vloggers the option to shoot their videos with a few different creative image parameters baked in. This includes setting the camera to 24p, a set of black bars to change your aspect ratio, your choice of color space and look, as well as the speed of the autofocus transition. While personally, I would never use something like this, there may be some people out there who find this useful, but you are baking in so much into your image. I think having the ability to turn off the aspect ratio bars would have made this feature a bit more useful, as I do like the fact that you can combine quick looks in the camera for faster turnaround projects. As we mentioned earlier, there is no Cine Eye mode in this camera, just a log mode, which uses the flexible ISO mode from other Alpha series cameras, which makes sense for the target market of this camera. This means exposing the camera is pretty simple. You have a range of exposure tools, but the zebra function really is excellent. It's great for exposing your footage quickly, and you can dial in a zebra for mid-gray when shooting at log 3, which is 41%, and a secondary percentage for your given skin tone exposure or clip point, and you're good to go. It's one of the best zebra functions on the market, it makes exposing really quick. Though I do wish there was a waveform still. Sony have put together a really great article about exposing S-Log3, which you can check out if you want to learn more about it. The ZV-E1 has a single UHS-2 SD card slot on the left hand side of the body, which was a bit weird to get used to at first as it's quite rare to see them on this side of cameras. If you want to record the highest bitrate footage, you will need to grab some fast V90 SD cards. However, you can grab slower SD cards if you don't need to record at the higher bitrate modes like 4K 120 frames per second in intra. Not having a second card slot may be a deal breaker for some, but considering the size of the camera and the market it is aimed at, I'm not too surprised. One of the downsides of such a small camera design means that one of the compromises is that the camera uses a micro HDMI connector. It's obviously nowhere near as robust or as easy to get hold of cables for as full-size HDMI, but I'm really not sure how they could have crammed that into a camera of this size considering just how dense it feels already and the tight port layout it has. If you do grab one, just be careful with it and maybe use a cable protector bracket on a cage if you really are worried about breaking it. You also can't output RAW via the HDMI, but you can output a nice clean 4K feed up to 60 frames per second if you want to record externally. Sony E-mount has now become one of the most fleshed out lens mounts on the market, which means you have a massive range of lenses to choose from for the ZV-E1. Just make sure that they cover that lovely full frame sensor. If you want great autofocus with clean, sharp imagery, buying native E-mount glass is the way to go. And there are plenty of options to choose from no matter what you want or need. But with how good autofocus has gotten now, I can see most people going with native with this camera. But of course, as it uses E-mount, it has a short flange distance. And this means you'll be able to adapt a range of longer flange lenses like EF or PL, and even vintage lenses, which may help you create a more unique look or stick to a tighter budget. With a powered zoom lens attached, you can use the rocker here to zoom, which can help you get some nice smooth zooms, which aren't as easily possible with other cameras and lenses. When not using a powered zoom lens, you can also enable clear image zoom and use the rocker to zoom in using that. This camera felt really good paired with Sony's new 16-35mm f4 powered zoom lens, and I bet Sigma's contemporary line of small primes or even Sony's compact series of f2.5 G primes will pair really nice with this as well. As with previous more vlogging focused cameras, the ZV-E1 has a built-in intelligent three capsule microphone on the top of it. This is a far better microphone than the regular included scratch microphones on other camera systems, and in the right situation, can capture some pretty decent results. 
quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. You can also go into the menu and change what direction you want the microphone to capture. It also has a 3.5 mm microphone input, which is in a really good position as it allows the monitor to be rotated around, which would be good for people filming themselves. I'm sure lots of people will run a top mic with this camera, and luckily the preamps are pretty good. You can also use a range of different MI Shoe audio accessories, such as the XLR K3M, which will allow you to get XLR inputs into the camera. So you have a good range of options to choose from, no matter what solution is going to be best for you. One of the biggest concerns I had when I first saw the ZV-E1 was how it was going to handle its heat management. Because of just how tiny the thing is, and the lack of any exhaust or intake for a fan. As with other Alpha Series cameras, you can go in and change the auto power off temperature setting, which would extend the camera's runtime when getting hot. From our very brief time with the camera, we did run some basic tests, and on average, you can record about 40 minutes before the camera turns off from overheating. So this really is one of the biggest downsides of the ZV-E1, and whether this is a deal breaker for you or not, will depend on what kind of videos and content you are creating. Physically, this camera is absolutely tiny. It's similar in size to the A7C and Sony's A5000 or 6000 series. It feels very dense, and the grip on the handle feels good thanks to the improved rubber used. It's incredibly light at just 483 grams, and this with a small lens on it would be a hell of a travel or under the radar video camera. There is nothing on the right other than the camera grip. On the left, you have a 3.5 mm mic in and USB-C port. You then have the single SD card slot, and lastly, the micro HDMI port next to the 3.5 mm headphone output. On the top, you have Sony's MI shoe, which means you can use any of the range of MI accessories Sony offer. This will be especially helpful for audio. Next to that, you have the built-in microphone. You then have a switch for the different camera modes, dedicated record button, a custom function button, which is by default set to the defocus mode I mentioned earlier, and then the shutter button, which has the power switch and a zoom rocker built onto it. On the bottom, you have a single quarter inch thread for mounting and the battery door for the MPF Z100 battery, the same battery that a lot of mirrorless Sony cameras use. I was actually quite surprised with this as it's quite a large battery for this camera and means that the battery life is actually pretty good. However, the door here is a little bit different from others. It looks like it can't be removed from the body completely, but it does have this little door so you can use a dummy battery and feed the cable out from it. But I would prefer the ability to remove the door completely. You can also charge the battery via USB-C as well as power the camera off of a USB source while shooting, which we did a good amount. On the back, you have a decent flippy screen and then a range of control buttons, which are laid out quite similar to other Sony mirrorless cameras. There are only two dials to control aspects of your exposure, which does limit how fast you can operate the camera. I know some people are definitely going to be disappointed that it doesn't have a viewfinder, and I can understand why. It would have been great to have one, but I'm sure this is one way that Sony kept the price down. As with any new camera release, I'm sure new cages and rigging, the ZV-E1 will be available very soon from all the regular rigging manufacturers and you may need to grab one depending on what you want to get onto your camera. While we have focused mainly on the video capabilities of the ZV-E1, it can also take photos, but it does lack some of the features that its bigger brothers do, such as the fast burst mode and a mechanical shutter. But for most video shooters who want the ability to snap a quick photo here and there, it can do that no problem at all. The ZV-E1 uses a very similar menu system to the other modern mirrorless cameras from Sony. You have the quick access menu and then the regular updated deeper menu system. This is good and if you've used any of Sony's Alpha series cameras before, you'll be able to get your head around this really quickly. It has a range of tools and features that you would expect from a regular Alpha series camera. The ZV-1 features a few ways to connect your camera. It features Bluetooth as well as 2.4 and 5 GHz Wi-Fi. However, the most interesting addition for streaming is the updated USB-C port, which is UVC and UAC compliant and it features improved resolution and frame rate options over the previous Alpha and FX series cameras. The ZV-E1 can now output 4K 30 or Full HD 30 and 60, which is an improvement even over the FX 30, which receives an update in this regard as well. But 4K 30 is a really nice addition and could be enough to save you from having to buy a capture card. You can also record internally while outputting via USB if you need to, which could be handy. Earlier this month, Sony released their new app, which is replacing the Sony Imaging Edge app, the Creators app. This new app has a bunch of new features and improvements, and Sony is even trying to make it a bit more community-driven, which is cool. I haven't had a massive amount of time with this new app, 
but it does seem like a decent upgrade over Imaging Edge. You can control your camera as well as transfer files from your camera to your phone or directly to Sony's new cloud storage solution. When you sign up for the app, you can get five gigabytes of free storage if you are not a Sony user or 25 gigabytes if you register a Sony camera with the account. With this new cloud system, Sony have introduced the ability to use apps like Mastercard, which is a cloud-based editor, and CI Media Cloud, which allows you to upload your rushes and stills into the cloud for remote collaborative workflows. I'm intrigued to test the app and the service out a bit more, as it could be a really great tool for people to use. So with it featuring the same sensor as the A7S III and that camera being so popular in the content creation market, what are the key differences between the two? Let's start with what the A7S III has that the ZV E1 does not. It has a more traditional mirrorless camera style body and layout, which some may prefer. It also has the fantastic viewfinder and all the dials for control of each portion of your exposure. It also has a longer recording time because of better heat management internally. It has a dual media card slot, which can take both UHS-2 SD cards as well as Super Express Type A cards, which are a more robust and faster media type, though much more expensive than SD cards. The ZV-E1 uses that micro HDMI port, whereas the A7S III has a full-size HDMI that can output 16-bit RAW. For some photographers, the 12 megapixel sensor in the A7S III may be a bit low, but the A7S III is a more featured stills camera than the ZV-E1, which doesn't even have a mechanical shutter. There may be some smaller minor details, but we haven't had loads of time with the ZV-1. However, we have mentioned a good range of features that the ZV-1 has that the A7S III doesn't. So hopefully this video has helped you understand whether the A7S III is worth the price difference or not over the ZV-1. The camera is priced just above the A7IV and FX30, and it is a good chunk more affordable than the A7S III and the FX3. So it sits in a bit of a weird place. For content creators and vloggers, this camera offers a lot of what's so great about the A7S III, but at a lower price, with some compromises, and with some additional features. There are clear pros and cons to each of the Sony cameras in this line now. And outside of Sony, I actually think its biggest competition is the Panasonic S5 II, which is priced pretty close to it. They both have different pros and cons as well, which make them both very compelling. If you want some more tailored advice, or to buy anything camera related, head over to our website to get in contact with our very experienced team. We've done in-depth videos on each camera we've mentioned here, and we've put links to them down in the description below. The zv one offers content creators the excellent image quality you expect from the A7S III with a body and tools that are aimed at vloggers and content creators. We want easier and faster tools to get good looking imagery. The new AI features are interesting, and while maybe not tools for everyone to use, there will be certain people who may find them very useful. Their biggest deal breaker is its limited recording time and shooting 4K because of its overheating. So if you're often recording long talking heads, this may impact you and you may be better off looking at other camera systems or waiting to see some more in-depth testing. If you have any more questions or thoughts about the zv one let us know in the comments below. And if you'd like the video, please give it a like and maybe consider subscribing so you don't miss out on our awesome upcoming content. And thank you so much for watching.